Hello, welcome. Thank you for joining us on this very cold and wet night. Uh, very grateful to have you as an audience today here, uh, just a few days before the holidays. Um, Welcome, I am Dr. Ritika Kaushik, uh, a postdoctoral researcher at Goethe University. Some of you have seen me before here. And uh, welcome to the fifth uh, screening and lecture in our uh, series, An Eye for the World, the Cinema of Satyajit Ray. Um, this is a series co-curated by uh, Vincent Hedegger, Daniel Fairfax, and me. And before I introduce the speaker for today, let me uh, uh, thank all our sponsors who have made this event possible. The Edicus Fund of Goethe University, the Hessisches Film und Medien Academy, uh, Verein der Freund und Förderer Foundation for International Relations at Goethe University, and lastly, Contrast, Trust and Conflict in Political Life, an excellence project hosted by the Research Center Normative Orders and funded by the Hessisches Ministerium für Wissenschaft und Kunst. It is my very great and special pleasure to introduce the speaker for today, who is both a professional mentor to me and also a very dear friend. Um, Rochana Majumdar is a historian of modern India. She is professor and chair at the Department of South Asian Languages and Civilizations and professor of cinema and media studies at the University of Chicago. She is a faculty associate in the Department of History and the Center for the Study of Gender and Sexuality. She also serves on the board of the Nicholson Center for British Studies and is a faculty fellow at the Chicago Center for Contemporary Theory. Majumdar's writings span histories of gender, marriage, and family in modern India, post-colonial history and theory, and histories of Indian cinema. Her first book, Marriage and Modernity, Family Values in Colonial Bengal, published by Duke University Press, is an innovative cultural history of the evolution of modern marriage practices in Bengal that challenged the assumption that arranged marriage is an antiquated practice. She has written extensively on post-colonial theory and history. Her 2010 book, Writing Post-Colonial History, is a useful guide to historians or anyone actually interested in understanding the impact of post-colonial theory on history writing. She is the co-editor with Depesh Chakrabarti and Andrew Satori of From the Colonial to the Post-Colonial, India and Pakistan in Transition uh, from 2007 and with um, um, Margaret Pernau, Helge Jordheim, Orit Bashkin, uh, and others of Civilizing Emotions, Concepts in 19th Century Asia and Europe uh, from 2015. Her interests in the culture and aesthetics of mass democracy has led Majandar to study cinema, in particular Indian cinema, and her most recent book, Art Cinema and India's Forgotten Futures, uh, published with Columbia Press in 2021 and with Pet Penguin Random House is not only the first monograph on this topic, but is a groundbreaking intervention in how we think of post-colonial history's relationship with art cinemas. The first part of the book discusses the rich history of global art cinema in India, and the second part brings alive films themselves as history. Through the work of three Bengali directors, Ritvik Ghotak, Mrinal Sen, and the director who cinemized the topic for this lecture and film series, Shatajit Rai. The book won the Chidananda Dashgupta Memorial Award for Best Writing on Cinema. It was featured in the long list of the Krasna Krauss Award and was chosen for the shortlist of the Modern Studies Association. Alongside a deep conceptual rigor, Majumdar's work is marked by an eye for detail and an expansive archival ambition involving the painstaking work of excavating these very unique archives. And her work has been supported by the American Institute of Indian Studies and the Harry Frank Guggenheim Foundation. Um, and she also writes on contemporary Indian political and cultural issues and is a contributor to the Anand Bazar Patrika in Bengali, uh, as well as Indian Express and Daily O. Um, she's currently also engaged in a collaborative project on the global history of the Presidency College, a college whose name has come up many times during this series as well. Please join me in welcoming Rochana Majumdar. Thank you so much, Ritika. It's it's a special honor and pleasure to uh, 
to be here not least because ritika was uh, was a doctoral student working in chicago not so long ago and it's just terrific to see you flourish in 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 this new environment i also want to thank professor hedegar for for the very kind invitation and professor fairfax and of course to you the audience for showing up on such a wet cold uh day all i can say is uh the feature presentation is going to be worth it um with that let me get into uh my remarks for today which i must say as i was thinking about it i and again at the back if my voice drops which it tends to just please wave your hand uh because i i tend to move around a lot and 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 you know sometimes i go in and out i was a little challenged by the format of um, of 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 this thing because i thought how can i talk about a film before people see it without really giving it away so with that all i can say is i'm going to do my best uh but and i hope there there are some spoilers in in that i don't want to actually give away and i hope i don't so with that what i mostly want to do is to is to perhaps set the film up and throw some questions your way in the hope that once we've watched it together we can actually have a collective discussion about some of the issues that come up uh over the course and uh the other thing i want to say is that um i'm going to go back and forth and i think this is this happens when you're working on on a figure like shotojit rai and you're a bengali speaker as i am i'm going to i tend to switch between calling him shotojit rai and ray uh so forgive that likewise with with one of his uh confreres I sometimes say sen sometimes say shen which is how a bengali would say it and i'm also going to refer to ritik ghotok but really i feel like you can't talk about ray rai without also referring to these other two figures and interestingly uh i understand that the impulse behind this series was the Shotojit Rai centenary which was 2021 this year 2023 which is closing very soon happens to be Mrinal Shen's birth centenary and just a couple of weeks ago we actually had a little retrospective in Chicago and 2025 is Riti Ghotok's birth centenary so these people were uh you know they were very close in age to one another but they also formed a cohort that uh we now look at them retrospectively but they were actually making their films and talking to each other oftentimes quarreling with each other in the context of a very live very live cine society film society context and when you watch today's feature presentation bear in mind that this john oronno or the middleman is the last of shotojit rai's city trilogy which happened to also coincide with another city trilogy made by mrinal shen and actually there is a there are lots of intertextual references within the films they all have unemployed youth at their center they all have as their background the bangladesh liberation war of 1971 and the refugee crisis they all have questions of the joint family breaking down the rise of the nuclear family issues of romantic love and of course ritika mentioned this they have student politics and uh, shotojit rai went to presidency college they have student politics and what is uh the the most left leaning aspect of this of the of the student movement which is uh, it was a ultra maoist movement referred to as the naxalite movement which you may have 
come across uh, in in speakers that preceded me, particularly when you watched Protidondi or The Adversary, which was the first of uh, of Ray's City trilogy, and whose mirror was actually Mrinal Sen's interview. So it would be good to keep in mind that these films are actually in conversation with one another. And there's actually another common factor. All these films, all the city trilogy, the city in question is Calcutta. The city from which uh, Shotojit Rai, Mrinal Chen, Riti Ghatok all came. Interestingly, uh, they all had uh, family, actually Shane and Ghatok, were refugees from, or Shane actually came to Calcutta during the Great Famine of 1943. Ray's family is also from East Bengal or what is uh, today Bangladesh. So that's another thing to bear in mind, which is another reason why the Bangladesh Liberation War features pretty centrally in, in, in their film. Now a word about my title for the talk, which is Shotojit Rai's City, where time stands still. And I want us to keep in mind both my title and also the title of today's film, which is Jono Oronno, which would literally translate Jono is people and Oronno is jungle. And the English subtitle of the film is The Middleman. And I think it'll be interesting for us to have a discussion on which title you think is more appropriate whether middleman works better or whether a jungle of people and particularly think about what is going on here with the with the invocation of of jungle with its uh, you know with certain allusions that it makes to an absence of the law anonymity uh, people just making use of each other a breakdown of relationships and then the middleman, which is the other name, or which is the English subtitle, English title of the film, which you'll see this word in a very crucial moment in the film. The the Bengali word for the middleman is dalal. Another word for it would be pimp. And it's important to ask why why the middleman is actually such a critical category in the film. Because if you think about the the geographical location of Calcutta, it's a port city. It's a city that uh, came into being with British rule. And you would think that brokers or middlemen would be all over the city. So why this negative connotation of somebody who does brokering for a living? Because here it seems like Somebody who's in the business of brokering, dalali, and its association with pimping, is really not producing any value. So it's almost as if the class that Ray came from, the middle class, was about producing value. If you were in business, you were producing value of a different kind. But if you're a middleman, you're not actually producing anything. So it'll be interesting for us to think about whether you think of John Oronno as a better, better title for the film or whether The Middleman works better. Now for this question of, well, why do I say time stands still? And here I want to uh, There, okay, thank you. You just had to get up. I want to refer to a story that Mrinal Shane actually wrote on the occasion of Ray's last birthday in 1992. And uh, the story is something like this, that Mrinal Shane's son, Kunal Shane, he actually lives in Hyde Park where uh, Ritika Shaw and I uh, all lived, which is where the University of Chicago is. And I'm going to just read out a couple of pages here from the from the story because I think he says it better than I will. Um, so he says, 
and this is a, a an article that he wrote, Mrinal Shen wrote in 1992. So he framed the essay around a letter that is ostensibly written by his son, Kunal, when he was a graduate student at the University of Illinois in Chicago. And Kunal had apparently gone to see Oporajito. You haven't yet seen it, but I think it's going to be shown in the winter semester, which is the second film of Ray's first trilogy, the Opu trilogy, The Unvanquished. So Kunal had gone to see Oporajito with some other graduate student friends of his. And after the film, uh, and they'd actually gone to see it at the Doc Films, which is the longest running film society in the United States. It was established, I think, in 1932. And it's the University of Chicago's Film Society. So he goes to see The Unvanquished with his friends and they get into a very lively debate at uh, after the film. And he comes home and he's very animated by the debate and he writes to his mother. He says, he, this is what he writes and I quote. He says, you had seen it, that is Oporajito, once before. Kunal reminded his mother. Even so, when it came to our local theater in Calcutta, Priya, you and I went to see it again. You wept as you watched the film. Your tears made me teary. When we returned home, you said to me, when you grow up, you too will leave the world. You too will leave for the world. And I, I will be left alone, like Shorbo Jaya, Opu's mother in the film. Then one day, you will return to see, and then there is this ellipsis. Years later, Kunal addressed the anxiety buried in the ellipses. He writes to his mother that she would not die alone, like Opu's mother did. Because he says, I'll return to Calcutta, and once my studies are complete, and I'll take care of you. Now, the reason I invoke this story is not really to rehash the mother-son relationship or raise universal humanism, which many people have written and talked about. What's interesting to me is actually something that uh, Shane commented on when he said that, uh, he says, it was Oporajito, so the unvanquished distinction as a film that almost four decades since its release, it came out in 1956, and, and this letter is actually being written almost four decades after, it had the capacity to be a bridge between a middle-class Bengali mother in Calcutta and her son pursuing higher education in the natural sciences in the United States. Kunal was studying uh, physics. A work of art is effective, he wrote, when it maintains fidelity to its own time and place, but is nevertheless able to dissolve all barriers and differences with the present to establish identification. And it's this question of identification, the fact that somebody who was watching it four decades after it was made could actually experience many of the same emotions that Opu experienced, uh, as you'll see in, 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 in The Unvanquished, because he's constantly ridden with guilt about leaving his mother behind. And somehow a, 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 this young man pursuing graduate studies in Chicago experienced many of the same emotions. And this to me is something which in my book I call the long present. It's actually a present that begins somewhere in the 19th century and continues well into the 20th century where it was almost as if Ray was a commentator, a historian if you will, who could address certain themes of the past as if they were live themes in the 20th century in the contemporary that his audiences were living through in most of his, um, his early work, which stretches from the Apu trilogy up to 1969, which is when Days and Nights in the Forest comes. And then there is a very sharp break with the adversary. And that's when I, I think his middle period begins. And we're going to be watching The Middleman, which is 1975. And 
what happens during that middle period, I want to suggest to you, is that this idea of a long present just shatters. Which is to say that from being somebody who had such a strong grip on what the history of Bengal, what the history of India was, how India went from being a colonial country into a post-colonial one, how there was a sense of history, you know, of development, of, of young Apu being a young boy to growing up to be a man in the city. He had a very clear sense of transitions, many transitions from city to country, from boy to man, from feudal to modern, all kinds of transitions. Ray was, he seemed to be really sure-footed. Until you come to the middle period and something happens and that kind of historical certainty about where things are going just vanishes. So what you have, what you see, you've seen it in the adversary, you'll see it again today, is that you see a lot of action on screen. Something is happening all the time. The frame is just teeming with detail. Burning trams, road rage, uh, things happening within the family, job interviews going bad, um, all, all kinds of things. Uh, migration, refugees, um, graffiti on the wall. There, there are just too many details in, in the films. And yet, nothing moves. The films are, if I may invoke another word, they're catatonic. There's still, there's a sense of stasis. The more, the more action you see on screen, nobody is going anywhere. I mean, in the adversary, you saw the, the protagonist leave the city, but really, is he going to a better future? We don't know. We don't think so. Nothing, nothing much is changing. So in the middle period, it's almost like you're stuck in the middle. And I want to spend a little bit of time reflecting on what this means. What does it mean for time to stand still? What kind of cinematic resources Shotojit Rai uses to, to make this felt? And to also think about, um, you know, what this means historically when we when we watch these films. I mean, since you've watched uh, Song of the Little Road, you've watched Adversary, we'll think a little bit about them in, in, in their historical context. So, in a, you know, so to put it differently, let's say, what does it mean for familial relations? What does it mean for gender relations? And then we're also going to talk about some of the stylistic departures that he had to effect and what kind of conversations he may have been in with not just Minal Shen, Riti Ghatok, other people within film society circuits, but also international cinema. Who was he arguing with? Who might, have, uh, might he have been arguing with? What was he rebelling against? And as, as people who are watching so many Ray films in, in a series, how might you get a grip on, on this, this period? So very quickly... Uh, to give you a sense of where where things begin, where we are, and where it goes from here. So the first film that he his his debut is Pothir Panchali, which you've seen. In the early period, some remarkable films, which again this one you have seen, uh, the Music Room, Debi, the Goddess, you is is coming up, and there are many many films. I mean, he was incredibly productive. So. Oroneddin Ratri, I think, is, uh, and I beg your pardon, I said 69, it's 70, is, I think, the start of the middle period. And then, of course, uh, there's Protidondi, the ad adversary. And uh, this poster was shared with me by Ray's son, actually, when I was trying to come up with a cover for my book. I was debating between this and Company Limited, uh, Shima Bodho, which you're going to watch again next quarter. And then this is our feature presentation, and I'll come back to, to this. And then the late period includes a number of adaptations. This one is a remarkable one, Ibsen's uh, Enemy of the People. There's Home in the World, which I don't know if you're watching. Um, and then there, this is his last film, Agontuk, 
1991. So he made a film the year before he 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 passed. So that's just roughly his oeuvre. Now, some of the things in terms of historical stuff that I'd like you to watch out for in today's film, and I'll, I'll structure my remarks uh, accordingly. And you've seen this also in The Adversary. Think of the middle period films addressing the energy question. And, you know, here's Ray's prescience in some ways as a filmmaker. I mean, we are in the middle of a climate crisis. We're in the middle of asking questions about fossil fuel uh, consumption, fossil fuel powered uh, economies. And you see a great deal of energy and infrastructural crisis in, in these films, particularly what Indians call load shedding, power cuts. They play a very important role in, in each one of these films. There's of course, educated unemployment, ennui, boredom, exhaustion, and a lot of corruption. And it's again important to remember that uh, The Middleman released in 1975. Actually, it was uh, at the height of the emergency, a brief period in, in India's history when rights to habeas corpus were, uh, were suspended, there were arrests happening all around, and actually a great deal of political and low ground level corruption was, was rife. And Ray, in one of his interviews, I think, uh, with Christian Brad Thompson, remarked that The Middleman is the only bleak film that I have ever made. He used the expression bleak. And I'd like us to think about why he said this. I also want to spend some time on what, uh, what, what we might think of as the women's question. I mean, what is, what's going on with gender in these films? And what I want to propose to you is that if in the early period, with uh, the Apu trilogy, the lonely wife, the big city, he seemed to really get into the question of gender. He really seemed to have an insight on, on the inner world of women. From the middle period onwards, something very strange is going on with women. I mean, they play important roles in the film, but you really don't know what anybody's thinking. Particularly in the company lim in the company limited, and I'd be very curious to hear what you think, Danny. Um, where you find the female protagonist occupies a ton of screen time, but you're never really given an insight into what the inner workings of her psyche might be. And ditto with the adversary and the middleman. It's almost as if Ray says that he's he's confounded by the new woman. And these films are much more about a crisis in masculinity. Each one of the films from Days and Nights in the Forest, The Adversary, Company Limited, The Middleman, are about men who are really falling apart. And it's, it, it, they're very uncomfortable films in certain ways. I mean, they're made with sympathy. Uh, I think Ray could never really be unsympathetic, except I think the middleman is an exception. But they are much more about, so if he abandons the women's question, it's almost, it's almost as if it's a gesture in humility. He's not going to venture into territory he doesn't understand. What he understands is masculinity and what he understands is that it's falling apart. So those are some of the themes that I'll get into in a little more detail. So this is actually, as you know, Ray planned his films meticulously. And each, for each one, he had these big red books, sometimes many volumes. And this is the opening sequence. And it's, it's actually a very long, and I was talking about what stylistic departures uh, we see in, in, in the middle period films. And if you recall, how many people were there for the adversary? Could I just get a show of hands? So several people. Now think of, and actually if you, if you go back to, to the adversary, and here you'll see it even more, they have very long opening sequences. I think the adversary was four plus minutes. 
This one is almost seven minutes, almost seven minutes. Company Limited 2 is very long. And it's almost like he, there are many, um, you know, there are many gestures to new wave new wave techniques so in in the in this particular opening sequence i think there'll be four freezes and uh, th there's an interesting use of um of sound uh, so actually throughout the film uh, watch out for the soundscape and it's a it's a very very long opening sequence and it's it's about an examination. And again, pay attention. In some ways, you know, Raymond Ballour, the French film critic, once remarked, I think it was in the context of the music room, he said, in some ways, Ray's opening sequences tell us a lot about the rest of the film. And here, I think, he really cues us. You'll see that the protagonist of uh, The Middleman is the only person who's not behaving like the rest of the people in this it's a in-person examination, and you'll you'll see that uh, there's mass cheating happening, and it'll be interesting to see that he's the only exception there, and then what happens to him. So he really sets it up, but it's a very very long opening sequence, um, and this again, as you can see, there's you know people just had open books. And this is part of the fetishization of education, but also this sense that education is not going to take you out of the rut in which you're stuck. So it's part of this feeling that I said of being of the stuckness of the present. You know, it's a, one kind of present that has ended. And from this present, there's no there's no getting out. You're you're in it. And the question arises then that as a filmmaker, who's also a very critically minded person, what's he doing with films then? What is the critical stance that he adopts? So if in his early period films, he's more like a historian who's telling us what happens when feudalism ends, what happens when Western education comes into the colony. In what what strains does it put on the family? What happens when you have an arranged marriage, but really you're exposed to ideas of romantic love? What happens when children leave home and become migrants elsewhere for employment and other reasons? So in other words, he's, he's a historian who's taking a look at the long 19th century and giving us a narrative of transition. He's giving us a narrative of how India goes from being a colonial nation to being a post-colonial nation state. So when this transition narrative is over, when Ray is no longer a historian, what is he in his films? And I want to suggest to you that he's an ethnographer. He's somebody who is watching what is going on around him compulsively in great detail and and you know their cinema is probably the best resource he has at his disposal because he's not going to give you any formulas for what comes after because he doesn't know what he's going to do instead is describe 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 he's he's an ethnographer who's actually capturing the minutiae of everyday life and almost asking you to stay with the present, or if I could cite Donna Haraway, almost saying, let's stay with the trouble and see what it feels like. You know, because at the moment, if we want to be ethical beings, we cannot, we cannot possibly say what, how we know, or we cannot possibly say we know how to get out of this condition. What we can do is remain in the present, document the present, and then see. Then just see if it takes us somewhere. So oftentimes, and I'll play a very short clip. I don't feel so bad playing it in the spoiler sense because Ritika actually used this as part of her promotional material. It's, it's, it's actually a fabulous clip. Again, 
you saw another interview in, actually you saw two interviews in The Adversary. The narrative of The Adversary was actually flanked by two two interviews. One where he's asked what is the most significant event of the 20th century? And he says the war in Vietnam. And the last one where there isn't an interview, it's actually a foiled interview where he loses his temper and walks out. But job interviews, and I'm just going to make a little list of, of the many things that keep on appearing in, in, the, in the trilogy. Am I out of time? No. Uh, just say when. How many minutes, how much time do I have? 10 minutes, okay. So you'll see interviews, cine clubs, soccer fever, homeopathy, road rage, little lurking dangers on city streets like the banana peel that he slips on, bomb throwing, remember in the adversary where he's trying to sleep in an air-conditioned uh, theater and a bomb goes off again because it's the time of the emergency, the Naxalite movement, the liberation war, cheating, crumbling infrastructure. This is actually a post-colonial state that has completely failed its citizens in, in delivering any kind of social service, whether it's power, whether it's jobs, whether it's health. So, And you really see crumbling infrastructure, both in transportation, in, in, in other buildings. And it'll be very interesting as this series goes to compare the infrastructure, so trams and buses, that you'll see in the big city, which was 1963, to what you see in The Adversary or uh, The Middleman. Class differences, the soundscape, there's a lot of noise in the film, a lot of noise. And I'm going to actually close with this. You see it and then you, you'll see a ton of processions. And all of this to to really make the point that I was making, which is to see Ray as a chronicler or an ethnographer of the contemporary. They are not exactly the same things. To be a chronicler or being an ethnographer are not the same, but nevertheless, he's documenting. He's documenting feverishly of what, what happens. And I want to close uh, my remarks with, again, another clip. And it's, I'm going to play a song sequence. Um, and it's actually the only song sequence that occurs in the City Trilogy. He uses a lot of music in his early period films. They more, in, in, in the middle period, he becomes much more selective with his use of songs. In Days and Nights, there are songs. In The Middleman, there are two song sequences. The first one is a religious song. And then the one that I'm going to play and I'm going to read a little bit because it's, it's, a, it's a complex sequence. It takes place during a power cut. And the song that plays actually is, is a Tagore song. It's a song by uh, the Nobel laureate poet Rabindranath Tagore. It's a very brief song. And Tagore, as you know, wrote hundreds of poems, which he also then composed the tune for. You'll see some beautiful illustrations of this in The Lonely Wife, um, and one is going to play here, and the, sound, the, the lyrics are very romantic. I mean, romantic, lyrical. They, they basically translate into something like shadows are gathering in the forests and clouds are rumble, rumbling in the sky. And they're very poetic, very natural. And it's worth asking ourselves, why does he play this song or why does he use this song at this particular juncture in the film? It's a very critical juncture in the film. That also, it becomes the soundtrack of a power cut, a load shedding. I mean, one critic, Chidananda Das Gupta, actually wrote that this is a shattering use of Tagore songs. Tagore, who was a really lyrical, romantic poet, who wrote about patriotism, love, nature, to make his poetry the soundtrack of a failed post-colonial nation state whose development infrastructure is crumbling is actually a very significant cinematic gesture, especially for a director for whom 
Mr. Gore was an inspiration throughout his life. So the lyrics of this song describe the beauty of the monsoons. It was composed in 1923, the, the, this particular songs, and it belongs to a repertoire of, of Tagore's uh, music that is called Nature. So when he, when he plays it, or when, when it becomes the soundtrack of a power cut, at a time when the protagonist, who you saw falling, having slipped on a banana peel, he talks about his entry into the profession of being a middleman. And he uses the word that I alluded to at the beginning, that of being a dalal, a broker who's also a pimp. So dalal is a, it can go any way, I mean, any which way. It's kind of what Walter Benjamin, in the context of the war here thought of as a collaborator, an intriguer who would give people away. So a dalal can, it's its really a kind of multi-vocal, multi-meaning word. And it'll be, I think, interesting for us to think about why at this point in the film, the protagonist, Shomnath, says to his sister-in-law that my line of work is not great. I've become a dalal. And I'd like us to actually think about it, particularly in the background of this song. And you'll see that unlike much of Indian cinema, where you don't know where the song is coming from, you realize that it's actually playing on the radio. So again, it's very, so it's, it's, it's part of a middle class family's routine. There are power cuts at a certain time in the day. And I'll just play the song and, and close. The capacity of Tagore songs to transfigure the real is not only bypassed, but utterly defeated in this instance. And you'll see the impact, I think, not just, I mean, you, you'll have to watch a few more films, particularly The, big, the, the uh, Lonely Wife, and you'll see the contrast between these. Ray's deployment of the song in a meticulously realist register makes Rovindra Shongit a banal fixture of urban everyday life, while the mismatch between the words of the song and the mise-en-scene is indicative that the real, what you see on screen, is too obdurate to be transfigured. In the present, Tagore songs had become a matter of unreflective habit. The radio's on, no one's really paying attention to what's, what's being played. They assumed a compulsory ritual function like arranged marriage and employment. Instead of attentive listening that was required of these songs, Ray makes the song a part of the soundscape of an urban home during a power cut. The song's description of the dark beauty of the rain and the monsoon clouds are pathetic in the context of a power cut. So to conclude then, how do we how do we interpret this uh, you know this this kind of of positionality where he is as I said dwelling on the crisis of masculinity where he's not giving you a way out of the present what does it what does it tell us about Ray as as a political filmmaker which is really the question that cine clubs at this time were asking of, of filmmakers that they thought everybody should watch. And when I say everybody, I mean a very small segment, I mean people like you, who would actually show up braving the weather. It was almost as if people believed that cinema had the capacity to transform the world. And Ray himself, you know, he began the film society movement in India with four other people. He, he established the first film club in 1947, the year that India became independent. Um, so the same year as independence and partition happened. That happened in August. The first film club was established in October. So this was a question he faced all the time and the comparisons invariably were with Mrinal Shen and Riti Ghotok. Ghotok would die the year after, after uh, the middleman. But the idea was that Ray had somehow abandoned the left. And I think a film like The Middleman leaves us with the question of whether he had abandoned politics altogether or 
whether he's actually doing something with politics that his contemporary leftists did not think to do, which is to say that we don't know the path to liberation. It's much harder to actually say, I don't know, but I have nowhere else to go. So I'll do what I do, what I know how to do, which is to make films. And that's my responsibility to both what what I do, but also to the people who come and watch me. And that's where I actually stake my reputation. He he made this comment that I don't know what Godard is doing. I don't know what Glover Russia is doing. And people took that to be a sign of arrogance, that he was basically just saying to hell with international cinema. But I'll, I'll, if I can find it, I mean, you know, yes. So in one interview, he famously said, uh, no, this is not, I've, I've lost my place. But he, he basically said that, you know, Mao has done a lot for China. I mean, with lots of qualifications, maybe he's gotten people out of poverty. At the time, most people in India didn't know any better because news didn't travel. But he said, you know, I don't want to, I, I don't want to be part of a society where art has no purpose or a future. So at the time, this was not what people would say because people were saying China's chairman is our chairman. And it was a very arch view of both the contemporary and of the political. And in that sense, in in my book, and forgive the the self, the you know, the self-promotion. In my book, I actually call Ray the untimely filmmaker. He was almost, particularly in his middle period, it was almost like he didn't belong to his time. But I think his films actually give us a resource for figuring out our own contemporary, which certainly throws up lots of problems. But I, for one, don't know what you know what 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 the solutions are. So with that, I give you John Orono. Thank you. I'm uh, I'm so struck by the film's mise en scène. It's so dense. It is. Yeah. And uh, the way in which every household or every office is distinguished through the way it's set up, mm-hmm. um, through the portraits on the wall or through the way the offices are set up and the way like we are asked to notice certain things about that place and the way the motifs keep on coming up. And I wonder like, if um, um, we can talk about how the film kind of sets up this class dynamic or this kind of, uh, when you mentioned at the beginning that we really need to think about this Dalali, the middleman mm-hmm. thing, the way it's playing out in the film is also through the mise en scène, right? Like how some people are very off beat with that mise en scène, but some like him, the protagonist, so Shomnath, is uh, are not, mm-hmm. and how the film's kind of setting up that dynamic there. And uh, um, I really wanted to hear more from you about like how we can think of the peculiarities of setting up the film this way. Yeah, and actually, I I realized one thing. I didn't say by way of setting it up, and I'll I'll come to your question in a second. Is that, and I think I noticed it so prominently this time that, so Shomnath is is a Bengali, and he's also a Brahmin. That is remarked on. But every other person, and this is actually something. I guess we'd be familiar with if we knew a little bit more about Indian last names. All of the business people, Goenka, Kejriwal, the mill owners, none of them are Bengalis. They're all uh, from the Marwari group. Mm -hmm. And they are, in, in in a certain way, they're not originally from Bengal. But then again, I mean, they're about... If you look at the history of migration into Bengal, they've been there from actually before the British. They were moneylenders to the British. And I just wanted to note that because I think the film plays that up, this whole business of insider-outsider. That said, I think the question about the mise-en-scene is also, it's a pre-globalization film. So there's this, 
extraordinary attention given to objects and a fascination with the object world, whether it's the cigarette case that plays music or the sex toys or, I mean, that was a screwdriver, right? I mean, yes. and then the obsession with, with, with everything, paper, blotter, typewriter, all kinds of things. Mm. I mean, even the chicken omelette. Mm. And it tells you that these are times of rationing and scarcity and the entire supply chain had broken down. And I think that's why he's focusing so much on the world of objects. And it's mm. supposed to tell us something that this is supposed to be a somewhat socialist state. Mm -hmm. but clearly, it's not getting what it's meant to uh, get to all citizens. And therefore, you have this ridiculous system, which is actually not generating capital. Mm -hmm. It's there's really no profit as such being made. I mean, we're talking about tiny sums of money, but it's a struggling, somewhat rotten developmental state. Mm -hmm. And, you know, as he said, it's a very bleak film. I mean, and again, it's mostly about men. Yeah. <laughs> that uh, Before I go to this question about men, there's also this thing about the way the state is set up for us in the film. Like, mm -hmm. So the way the city is set up, for example, and it, since Pratidwandi is so fresh in our minds, we just saw it a few weeks ago, um, the city there, which is, you know, a cinema hall or the streets that are where people are crossing um, or um, uh, things like that. Here it's like it's the trade center market. It's the area where the refugees are. It's the, um, uh, the street where he falls off on a banana peel mm -hmm. and meets the Dalat, you know, the other guy. Yeah. Uh, so there is a way in which somehow the mise-en-scene has also shifted in a very bleak way and grown more inward somehow. Very claustrophobic. Very claustrophobic. I mean, yes. each of these offices, they're not really offices. They're renting out every little space of the city that they can. Mm -hmm. So everyone gets a table. And somebody gets a table in the morning. They're banking on the fact that a businessman mm -hmm. with three businesses to his name, and they all exist on paper, he's going to be out most of the time. And also nobody's conscious of labor. I mean, we noticed that he was actually riding a hand-pulled rickshaw at one point. And we didn't really focus on the laboring bodies. And it's in some ways, it's, it's not even Ray's point. His focus is completely on the middle class, mm -hmm. his own class, and it's complete and utter bankruptcy and how it's not going anywhere. And the generational stuff is also interesting. Mm -hmm. And I mean, someday maybe you all will do a Mrinal Sen or a Riti Ghotok retrospective and then you'll see the dense, dense intertextuality. I mean, I'll just say this one thing and stop. If you see Riti Ghotok's Shuborno Rekha Golden Line, there too a brother goes one night to, to a prostitute and realizes it's the sister, that it's his sister. And she kills herself, except now she she's his friend's sister, but no one's killing themselves anymore. And a mm. decade has passed mm. between that film and this one, and something's changed. So There's Also, the father figure seems to be so different from a decade ago. Mm -hmm. Because I was thinking like how Ray has also grown, right? He's now in his 50s when he's making this film. And so from the big city, for example, where the parents are this you know, people who are finding it very hard to move on with the world. The world has changed. The daughter of the family is like out working and making a living. Uh, but the parents are finding it very hard to understand this change. And the film's sensitive towards that, but they're also like kind of off their time. They, are, mm -hmm. they don't belong in the present in a way. Mm -hmm. But here the father's curiosity about understanding the present, about I want to understand things, I want to understand. But they want to also kind of protect him, from mm -hmm. the reality. There's something going on there with that and Ray as a historian, his voice, right? Something, what's going on there? That's a really interesting point. I wonder what others also made of it. I mean, I. it's interesting to reflect on what the parental generation is doing in this set of films because there was the mother and the adversary and an uncle who you barely see. There's the father here who obviously gets much more uh, time. 
and these figures will keep appearing mm -hmm. actually in company limited they make parents make a brief appearance and i'm curious to hear what people what you thought of the generational dynamic i mean in some ways it seemed true he was very curious and anxious for his son but really his his expectations seem calibrated i mean was he so naive mm. i mean he tried to he seemed to be operating on a calculus that for a business you need capital mm. now his son doesn't have any so what does he think the son is doing it's unclear i mean i it it's hard to know and i'm again i'd be curious to hear what what others think and in some ways there's an expectation of transparency and then saying that oh when it's not coming he's sad but then his friends come and show him how their par their children are settled abroad and it's very hard to read his expressions mm -hmm. there mm -hmm. um the father's a curious character and yet he's so central in yeah. the film um i uh, let's open it up and see yeah. uh, if people have questions and thoughts comments about okay i start thanks very much for your lecture um i'm not so sure if this film is about a broken masculinity I would say everybody's broken in there except maybe the father and the daughter, uh, the sister. And I would also say that poor people play a short role. Mm -hmm. That's the, so to speak, the, sm the small pimp at the end who's like a reflection of him, the bigger pimp. Mm -hmm. And of course, he's the middle man pimp mm -hmm. in comparison with the big pimp. Yeah. Um, basically, everybody's going for the racket. Mm -hmm. right it's all a big racket it's mentioned the term bribery and all that all that kind of stuff um so i would say uh no it's just it's not just about the middle class the whole society is structured like that mm -hmm. the the clerk is a drunk mm -hmm. it's the failed state and mm -hmm. all that kind of stuff so um i would agree with that kind of diagnosis but i wouldn't agree with the part about the masculinity because obviously the women are like slaves and so on too you know, and it's like all of them don't have a chance or maybe they don't want to say no for a certain kind of reasons, forces, obligations, whatever you want to call that. Right. So maybe you can comment on that. I, yeah, I think I think you're right that everybody's broken. Now, whose break do we actually get to see? You know, so for example, when he realizes that it's his friend's sister. And there are a few times that, I mean, mostly you see her, prof like you just see the side of her face and half of it's kind of, it's in the shadows. And then when he says, oh, we don't have to go. And she says, you're behaving like a child. Really, the focus is on Shomnath and how compromised he's feeling. What a bad friend he has been. What a... You know, not the kind of person who just missed on us by seven marks. I mean, he is the center of attention. We don't really get to see what Juthika or Kona is thinking. There was that moment with his sister-in-law where he says to the sister-in-law, I remember one thing, you were crying on your wedding day. Now, do we probe why she was crying? Did she have, did she also have an, a lover who she didn't marry? and ended up marrying Shomnath's brother. We never, we, we don't really get to anybody's motivations. Then the girlfriend, Shomnath's girlfriend, who ditches him and has a baby. I mean, she's the most, in some ways, she's the least developed character, I think, in all of Ray. Yeah, There's but, but no character development whatsoever. So it's almost like he's showing us these women, but there's no story of motivation. Do you know what I mean? That's, that's all. Agree, but she answers in terms of, that's what you want to see, mm -hmm. the woman or me crying at the wedding. Right. But we never hear what her story is. That's all I'm saying. I mean, it, we may want to give her a story, but we're not really allowed to give Shomna the story. We're told what his story is. So in other words, if there's anybody who has depth in these films, it's Shomna or his friend, the one who becomes a taxi driver. We, he goes and slaps his sister, for heaven's sake. 
She's the one who's bringing in the money. Do we ever get to hear what she then says back to him? So there's this low-grade violence in the family. We see the father's rage. But you don't really f- see what any of the women are thinking. And I think that that's constant in the adversary. I mean, remember that scene in the adversary? I was asking Ritika whether anyone commented on it when the sister dances on the roof. That's the strangest scene. And all you see is, in that case, Shiddhartho imagining what the sister might be doing at a party. We don't really see what the sister is thinking. So that was my only point, that there's no surface depth, no interiority. Of course they have it. We just don't see it. It's also as if it, the crisis has happened to them, right? We don't see it happening. So the, right. you know, when, they, when we do see the women, we uh, kind of see them having either made a decision or kind of coming to terms with it yeah. or reminiscing about things. But we don't, we, with him, we see the crisis happening in like kind of live. Exactly, yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's almost, you know, there's, there's been so much written about the modernization of Indian women and there's this, there are so many theses that, yes, you introduce women to Western education, employment, etc. But somehow you maintain the traditional core. I mean, that's often the thesis that's uh, put forward in thinking about the women's question. It's almost like Ray doesn't want to go there. He doesn't even, I mean, how do you even even properly formulate the question for women? And it seems to me that he's saying, I don't want to. Let me just stay with people I know. And it's basically a younger version of himself. But it was just thinking, I mean, it's not like Ray doesn't have fully developed female characters. Exactly. Like Devi, Charu. Uh, in the early uh, period, yeah. Um, the, the the mother and the sister in, in Potter Panchali. Mm-hmm. Uh, this is a choice. Yes, ex- it's very much absolutely. A it's completely a choice, completely. And this is the point I was making in some ways that, and again, the distinction that I was making as, say, the filmmaker as the historian and what I was saying, the filmmaker as the ethnographer. And this is particularly prominent when it comes to the question of women. So whether it's the really old grandmother in the Thakurun or Durga, the sister who dies, or the mother in Pothir Panchali, he has tackled the question of women, whether it's in the battle of superstition versus rationality, questions of migration, who gets left behind, who is the victim in a war of attrition, He's always tackled the question of women when it comes to his early period. In Charulata, it's all about, it's called the lonely wife. I mean, he really gets into the question of loneliness for Charu. And he's he's on very, he's super confident there. It's in the middle period thing. And again, I mean, there's days and nights, there's the adversary. It's very prominent, and that's why I just wish I could sit in the room and watch Company Limited mm-hmm. with you. It's almost as if these women, he has decided that they are ciphers, and he's not going to... He's shying away from the question of second wave feminism. Let's just put it like that. I mean, he knows it's happening. He's registering that it's happening because these women are out in the workforce in some way. They're educated. But what it's doing, he seems not, it's not, I mean, he's not tackling it. And it's weird because in the big city, which is just 12 years before this, he's showing the plight of the working woman. And actually, I mean, you know, in this, he's really different from Gordo Corsen who either get into the melodramatic mode or something. Here, there are women all over the place, but there's, he just does not engage with their psychodynamic. And it's absolutely a choice. But the question I think we need to ask ourselves is, well, why is he making this choice? Why is it? And, you know, there's so much said about what does it mean for a feminist agenda to be spoken of by men? And it's almost like Ray anticipates that question. and he, It's as if he's responding by saying, this is, I'm not the best qualified to get to this. I don't know. I read that into it because he's been so 
so comfortable when it comes in in all his early films there's always some woman that we remember i think there are two hands there's danny and then just, this just a slight the back. maybe a slight counterpoint i think the 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 character of the the sister who becomes a prostitute is actually quite impressive mm-hmm. because she is the one who is the clearest about the life choices she made and you know when she sa- says to him don't be a child mm-hmm. Uh, she basically asks him to grow up and acknowledge the situation that he's in, which she has done. Mm-hmm. It's not a great choice she had to make, but but she's living up to um, the the role that she has assumed, and that's also why she insists so much on having her, you know, street name and Vitka. have him address her with her street name and not, uh, you know, bring up bring up her past and. But in any case. So here's the thing. You just gave her a story. <laughs> Ray didn't. Right? I mean, you said she made some difficult choices. We don't really know. Because he didn't, I mean, we're assuming that would be the most common story, that, or that would be the most predictable story. But he doesn't say it. It's a lot of people might write that tale for her. It's just that you know he hasn't authored it. Whereas with Chomnath, we go to we see his decision making process from the restaurant, in the taxi, in the in Mrs. Ganguly's house. There are he just takes us through painstaking detail. I mean, there are so many times when he says, "Let's forget it. Let's forget it." But with her. She says, don't be a child. But really, I mean, you know, we know that she has, we're told by that guy, Choron, that, oh, let her go by 10 o'clock. Did she say it? I mean, we just don't, we don't hear anything. The most common assumption would be, yes, it was a difficult choice for her. We just never hear it from her. It's just that Ray women are not so bad at speaking for themselves. I mean, so far in all of the early films, they do quite effectively. I mean, even in Devi, when they don't speak, mm. they actually express their indecision very volubly, as you'll as you'll see again. Whereas here, they don't speak. Uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna use a very anachronistic mm-hmm. term. Is this a film about incels? <laughs> <laughs> I was hoping oh someone will bring that up. <laughs> Do you, well, to expect, do you see parallels between this crisis of masculinity that Satyajit Ray is depicting and perhaps kind of a contemporary uh, similar crisis of masculinity? I don't know so much about incel culture. I mean, you know, my only, my one reference is uh, Amiya Srinivasan's excellent treatment of the subject in that book, The Right to Love, or uh, the Oxford philosopher who, but... I would want to say, my impulse would be to say no. Because again, the the thematization of what we call incel culture has to do again with globalization. Um, and this is a very distinctly pre-globalization period. And the thing is, we're looking, I mean, in, in a sense, this is also a deeply transitional moment. I mean, there are certain... He comes home, he asks his sister-in-law for tea. It's not as if there's a hatred for women over here. Nor is it the case, I mean, he thinks that the girlfriend is not going to ditch him. You know, when he says that I'm going to have this job for $300, he's lying. But he doesn't think she's going to leave him. I mean, hes I don't think there's a kind of hatred for his own masculinity. It's just that... Let me put it this way. There's a reproductive futurity for men. I mean, he wouldn't, he would have been married to her. For the women in the film, except he doesn't. I mean, in in the adversary here, in the other one, we're basically looking at people where there are no children involved. 
I mean, even in the com- in Company Limited, if you remember, the child is in a boarding school. We never see a child. And, but it's definitely, it's still very much a heterosexual imagination of the family. In that sense, I, I don't think it's an incel culture. It may be homosocial, but I think it's overall a heterosexual imagination of the world. But it's a very interesting question. I'll I'll keep thinking about it. Um, if I can just quickly say something about the beginning of the film when we see uh, Shomnath with uh, the girlfriend, ex-girlfriend of Pranashan's character. Um, there is a way in which there has been like a loss of tenderness, you know, like from the adversary where we still see this chance encounter leading to a romance, right? And then they're exchanging letters or of some kind. Here there seems like an impossibility of tenderness. And I think that's maybe what Danny's question is towards too, that, you know, what is happening there where this like the relation has somehow changed it's, it's very formed, brittle right it's very brittle and it's uh there isn't that identification with the, that we can seek with the, the other with the, with the others and there's some like lack there yeah but i don't i'm not even sure if we identify with shomnath at all you know like what's going on there even in terms of the way he's looking at her it's a it's a good point except I mean, he has such a tender relationship with his sister-in-law. That's the interesting. There's so much trust and so much, you know, they they have the sweetest relationship. And again, it's a bond that has a history in Charulata, where the you know where that relationship produced tremendous pain, mm-hmm. and there was actually a romantic affiliation mm-hmm. there. Here, there isn't, but it's not. It it's not a world where female sexuality is particularly threatening. It's just not available because because people are so uh, they're struggling to make a livelihood. Matter of factness about it, somehow, yeah, right? The yeah, something like that. Yeah. Have a question with Verena. Um, I wanted to come back to the banana peel in the very beginning when there was put a big focus on the banana peel he slipped uh, on. And I was wondering whether this kind of, especially this um, uh, pushing away onto the street of the banana peel, there was so much uh, tension on it that I was thinking, it's kind of, I mean, what is this kind of a gesture? It's Isn't it a gesture of taking care? And this taking care is something that is not happening in the film? Everybody is just about him or herself? Well, and yes. Thank you. So, I mean, I think the point over there, though, is about a city whose civic services are broken. I mean, first of all, this guy says to the vendor that oh booksellers don't read their books are you a fruit seller whoever eats his fruit and you see the fruit seller he clearly is not somebody who looks like he consumes much fruit and then he eats it and he just throws the banana peel over there and again famously in a tropical country and this is something we grew up hearing that you can slip they're very slippery orange peels banana peels they're very slippery you can slip on them but the point here is the city is everybody's garbage dump. There are no, there's there's no public sewer system. It's dirty. Everything is really dirty. I mean, half the film was really dark. Half the time there was no power. Uh, it's, you see these crowds, you see lots of many kinds of bodies. I mean, including Shomnath, who's middle class, but you know, he's he's having these vitamin C supplements. And it's just, it's a picture of, he doesn't dwell on it, Ray, so much, but it's a picture of malnourishment, underdevelopment, claustrophobia. You have a follow-up? Yeah, I mean, uh, 
he i think it's him who pushes it at the side uh, yes he does side. yeah and i mean that's of course going in how do you say rindstein i don't know at the side of the street and where there is garbage also but it's also a caring gesture and i found that because that so that nobody else, else is, slip. is slipping on it again and uh, it's it's um has a lot of im i mean it's very long this um Uh, this thing, and I found, but but as far as I could see, it was one of the very few caring moments, moments yeah. by a man. You know, that's a really interesting point, and you, you almost want to speculate that does he do it because he's still not cynical yet, and then we're meant to think that afterwards, once he gets really busy, he's not going to do that, and somebody else will slip. But then the city is just full of dangers, whether it's from a innocent banana peel or from God knows what else. Because uh, we see his friend's father who has a broken ankle from just stepping into potholes because there's not enough lighting. So the streets are poorly maintained. And this is supposed to be almost 30 years after the end of colonialism. And really the only memory of colonialism, actually there are many memories of colonialism. The When you write, um, I beg to apply, like when he's writing the application letter, the language is really archaic. But then they're also selling off these colonial mansions and selling every little part of it. The teak doors, the toilets, the marble, everything is for sale. But that's that's a very nice point, actually. It shows his entering the dark world, as it were. Yes, please. Um, first of all, thank you very much for being here. Um, maybe let's come back to the male or toxic male masculinity thing that you mentioned. Um, within this film, I feel like the protagonist is really trapped into class and patriarchy, remaining, status, even maybe thriving. And I felt really reminded of um, contemporary discourses about masculinity right now, because when I open my YouTube on the phone, on my mobile phone, I get instantly in, uh, sucked into create passive income, um, multi-level marketing stuff, which deals with a lot of illegalities or s like schemes and stuff like this mm -hmm. um, but now still we have discourses about patriarchy about capitalism about an image of an, how a man is supposed to be yeah. how much he has to earn and stuff like that so that really rem reminded me of it so maybe more so in some ways I mean It, it, again, it's very interesting that you would say it, and actually Ritika was mentioning this in another context. There are very interesting ways in which these films still feel very contemporary. I mean, in some ways they've aged, but there are still really ways in which they feel contemporary. And it's actually, you know, I've written about it, but I actually didn't remark on this. I didn't... I don't know why I didn't, but uh, I somehow didn't notice the fact that the f that that the fact that Shomnath is a Brahmin. Ray actually dwells on that, and it's almost like he makes fun of his being a Brahmin, and it's there are all these men who say to him, "Oh, you can't be engaging in petty trade because you're a Brahmin," and it's almost like. What good is being a Brahmin if you cannot feed yourself? You're supposed to be upper caste. You're supposed to lord over other castes. You're supposed to be educated. That's what Brahmins traditionally did. But here you are. You didn't do bad, well in your exams because you write. I mean, the whole thing is made a mockery of. Like the entire system of education based on an examination system, which is supposed to get you a middle class job. When the father says, nobody in our family has ever been a businessman. And then in an afterthought, he says, but some generations ago, nobody worked. So what did they do? They were priests or teachers. Now, of course, they can't be that. So there's actually a commentary here on the caste system. It's not explicitly developed. 
and i think today when i was watching it again i thought wow i mean where was he going with this because this is also a time where throughout the country there are actually this there have always been atrocities against lower castes but this is a time when people are drawing attention to it and ray instead of focusing on on lower castes as such he attacks an upper caste person by simply showing how inadequate that person is he routes it through gender he routes it through an inadequate masculinity but really he's questioning existing hierarchies in society but the last thing that i want to note over here is that and maybe that's why these Danny was saying this earlier that you know we don't pay enough attention to the middle period because they seem too detailed and in a way that i think the apu trilogy also has a lot of detail but somehow it's easier to make sense of i mean you can say that oh this is how a village used to be this is what people did this is how a poor family lived i mean somehow it seemed simpler here there's just too much there's nothing that's very simple i mean each time i try to answer a question there are 10 threads in my head and i think in part watching these films is laborious because there's a lot going on and there's a this there's, there's a lot to think through so i mean again i was I, that's not a direct response to your question but i i i i think that that yes there's a lot happening with masculinity but it's not just that it's a lot of other things that he also takes up that's a very circuitous response thank you i have a question about the title and the subtitle of the movie i was asking myself um did he choose the sub english subtitle himself or did the distributors choose it or did, did he authorize it and i think that i like the the bengali title better because the english title it seems one dimensional we know that middlemen they don't produce anything mm -hmm. and there is expression of cutting out the middleman in right. in order to avoid cost right. but the bengali title there is the word for people jana and then there mm -hmm. is a word for forest but there forest. are many different types and different words of forest and yes not jungle or popon or van and i think oranya it is seems to me the most sanskritized word for f forest which yes. there is as yes. opposed to people so there's the dialectical tension so am i right that i like the bengali title better than the english one so again thank you for for coming back to that now one thing i wanted to say in the beginning but i also did not want to I just throw information out there now the film is it's an adaptation from a novel by uh by an author who goes by the name of shankar and interestingly one little nugget about him is that he started his career as a typewriter cleaner So remember there was that scene where you actually see there's a lot of the typewriter happening. Now you could say that people wrote job applications with a typewriter, but I think it's also raised nod to Shankar. And Shankar is also the author of Company Limited. So he adopted adapted two novels one after another. But you're absolutely right that throughout the film there's also a play on Sanskrit. So when the sister-in-law says that oh when he says my line of work is not good it's dalali and she says oh talk to your brother he'll come up with a sanskrit name for it and then everything will be all right and that's a very arch way of of ray already taking on this idea i mean you know we now live in a state in india where it's very difficult to um to raise questions about whatever it is that belongs to tradition and i say tradition with an inverted comma and ray has a very he doesn't especially like the idea of tradition being something that's not up for critique and he's done it throughout his films and he does it here all over again and 
so the word aranya, as you say, it is a Sanskritic word. There are lots of very beautiful Sanskrit plays which are all about the beauty of the forest. Except in this case, it's it's not a forest that's terribly pretty. And he's using it deliberately in the sense of the wilderness. I mean, of course, this is before the day, I mean, before the time of a thematization of anthropogenic climate change. So he's not really thinking through that. I mean, you know, there's a kind of, there's a thinking here about the city being the jungle. It's not really the the font of civilization as we know it. It's actually one there's, where there's lawlessness, there's darkness, lack of transparency, and you cannot make sense of it either with, with tradition or frankly with the codes of modernity as they have been handed to us. So really the question is how do you make your way through this maze? So I agree. I don't know if the middleman was Shankar's name or if Ray came up with it. I think it's the latter because I've read translations, but they are later translations. And one last thing I want to say is he said in an interview that, you know, he, the early period films are all by very famous authors. So he's been adapting. Most of his films are actually adaptations. Then after a while, he started to write his stories himself. But most of them are adaptations. And mostly he worked with very well-known authors. Really, I mean, the pantheon of well-known Bengali authors. Then in the middle period, he selects new authors. And he writes in one place that they are very weak stories. And actually, if you read the original stories, there are huge liberties he takes. Actually, the women are far better worked out in the, in the stories. But they are weaker. They are less interesting. But I think you're totally right that there's a play going on here with language. And thank you for picking up on that. <coughs> Um, we should probably call it a day, but uh, one last two, question. <laughs> two, <laughs> two, 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 two this small is things. The best crowd. <laughs> yeah, it's amazing. Um, it's, it's just, uh, I mean, you you were um, uh, pointing out how this is sort of a critique <laughs> of the educational system and of the status of Brahmanism. That's also mm -hmm. in Potter Pancholi because mm -hmm. they're a Brahmin family. Uh, the father can't sustain the family anymore. He also fails at educating his son. It's one of the things that he says, you know, uh, didn't even manage to do that. And the education he gets instead with the shopkeeper is ridiculous. It's, mm -hmm. it's not an education at all. So that, that in a way, that critique uh, was already there. But I, I just briefly wanted to talk about the soundtrack a little bit and about the music and the... the uh, indirect presence or absence of it. Um, mm -hmm. One of the interview questions is who wrote Vande, ba uh, Vande Mataram, the Congress, the Congress yes. national song, and it's Bunkin Chandra. And then there's the immensely touching uh, song, the, uh, the Tagore song, mm -hmm. written by the author of both the Indian and Bangladeshi national mm -hmm. anthems. Yes. Um, and so there seems to be a lot of political symbolism also going on with the music, and and there's and at the same time it's a very sparse soundtrack. Yes, there's very 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 little music. Uh, we also observed um, with the adversary already. It's not a realistic soundtrack at all. Um, it's it's very, you know, designed in a way. So I just wonder if you had something to add on so, the soundtrack. Yeah, it's very, very thoughtful. So I want to respond a little bit to the Pothir Panchali question. Yes, it's also about education. But actually, there is, throughout Pothir Panchali, there's almost an affection for English education, which is actually developed further in Oporajito, which, are you all watching it? Yes. Yes, so it's... And um, it's already there in Pothir Pachali with the globe. And even in the way the band plays, it's a long way to Tipperary. I mean, you know, there's, there's, there's affection, even if it sometimes seems anachronistic. It's almost like colonialism has happened, but there are certain things that we've, we've taken up and made our own, and English is part of it. 
and it doesn't so much yes there's a critique of rote learning uh but it hasn't become this object of almost venom i mean here it's there's a lot of rage in in this film and on the artificial artificiality of the soundtrack i couldn't agree more both in adversary and here you know we there are references to urban animals so in both cases there are cats there are stray dogs in 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 the adversary where he wakes up from his very fevered dream and you know there are some dogs howling in the neighborhood and it's almost like what does the city sound like it's just noise or nothing i mean and i think we sense that in the op- long opening sequence the first sound we hear is actually of the invigilator in the examination hall we hear his shoes that's totally artificial i mean who gets to hear somebody's shoes in such a chaotic examination hall but of course he magnifies that and and then there you know then we hear these voices where they say silence please i mean of course nobody is silent there but i i completely agree with you that this is it's almost like the the noises are they in the city are they in ray's head are they the soundtrack is some characters register them it's unclear but yes it's a very it's a very confusing soundtrack but given that this is a filmmaker who works with a lot of deliberation i think it's just deliberately there and i think somebody will write in a very interesting way about that some day but thank you so much for staying on for all the engagement it's been a fantastic experience well, thank you for coming all the way here and uh talking about the film in such a generous way and pleasure thank you this has been great thank you thank you all.